right. Good morning, everyone. Good to have you here. Good to have uh, those of you online as well. Just a couple of uh, announcements. It's in your uh, in your bulletin as well. But uh, family Wisconsin Family Council has uh, sent us a couple of uh, items for uh, things us to be familiar with regarding uh, the election. Uh, it's a voter resource guide, so there's uh, something that, uh, you know, a comparison between the candidates. And then they also have a, uh, it's called Honoring God Flyer, and it's just a reminder of why Christians should vote. Uh, there's some biblical reasons for doing that. There's some practical reasons for doing that. And uh, this pamp, uh, little brochure outlines those. It's uh, very informative, so I would encourage you. They're on the back table there. I uh, encourage you to take one of those and uh, uh, be informed. Uh, we have the opportunity and we have the responsibility and we the privilege and we have choices. And so we need to uh, take advantage of those and be faithful. <clears throat> So what is Satan's goal for your life? Yeah, you heard right. I didn't say what is God's goal. I said what is Satan's goal for your life? Just as God has a goal for your life, uh, Satan does as well. What are Satan's goals? What are his plans? Uh, in the big scheme of things, I think you can boil them down to two. One is Satan wants to keep Lost people, lost. He wants to keep lost people from being saved. But then he doesn't give up once we become saved. Once we are saved, his goal is for us not to live for God. He doesn't want us to live for God. He doesn't want us to obey God. And, and that may be oversimplifying it, but if you take all the things that Satan wants to do, they're really, you can boil it down to one of those two areas. If you were a lost person, Satan wants to keep you that way. Uh, if you're saved, he doesn't want you to live for God. He, he wants you to sin. And last week we looked at how Satan used deception. We're talking big picture. We're talking about the wiles of the devil. We're talking about the schemes of the devil, what the devil does. And we need to, he has devices, he has schemes, he has goals. And last week we saw his deception of Adam and Eve. And we know from uh, John 8, 44, Jesus says there is no truth in Satan. There's no truth in him. He is a liar and he is the father of lies. And just in a way of a quick review, what were the lies that he told Adam and Eve that we looked at from Genesis uh, chapter 3 last week? Lie number one, God's provisions are not enough. God's provisions are not enough. He got them to focus on what they couldn't have, one tree, and they forgot all about what they did have. Thousands, literally, I believe, thousands of trees. And so he, he got them to he, he got them to forget about that the trees that they had were pleasant to the eyes and they were good for food. They had everything they needed. But Satan wanted them to think about, oh, you're being restricted. Something's being withheld from you. Uh, you don't, you aren't, there's things that you could have that God is keeping you from. And so Satan uses that lie on us today. He didn't use it once and he's done, he scrapped it. He still uses that today. Satan suggests that God is not enough and that what God gives is not enough. And so mankind looks for peace and pleasure and satisfaction and purpose in life in the world, in the things of the world, instead of looking to God to meet those needs. Line number two, God's pronouncements are not true. God's pronouncements are not true. I hate, I, I mean, I'm, you know, you talk about being misquoted. You snap that and say, listen to this preacher. He says God's pronouncements are not true. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the lie that Satan says is God's pronouncements are not true. How Satan wants to cast doubt on the words of God. Ye shall not surely die. Now Satan doesn't use that lie anymore, really, because we have seen death and we know that people die. But Eve, listen, 
to him when he whispered, ye shall not surely die. Underneath that lie, ye shall not surely die, is the intent of Satan. Satan wants mankind to believe that there are no consequences for sin. Let me say that again. Satan wants people to believe there are no consequences for sin. And so the lies are different, but underneath it all is that God, Satan wants you to doubt God's pronouncements about sin and about the punishment of sin and judgment in hell. He wants you to think those things are not true. And so Satan has deceived literally millions of people into thinking God doesn't care about sin. God doesn't know about sin. God will not hold you accountable for sin. There is no heaven. There is no hell. We die and that's it. And there are, are countless millions that Satan has deceived. But Satan doesn't lie just for the sake of lying. He really wants people to not to be deceived, to think God's word is not true, because he wants them, he, he wants to drag them to hell along with them. If people don't believe there is a God, and if people don't believe they are sinful, and if people don't believe that there's consequences for sin, and people don't believe God is holy, they're being deceived. And consequently, that's right where Satan wants them. And they will join him in hell. And that's it. You just think of the millions who have said, God won't send anyone to hell. Mm -hmm. And that, that is a lie from Satan. And so Satan's desire for the lost is to keep the lost from getting saved. But what about the saved? What, what is Satan's goal for those that are God's children, that are born again, that uh, are on their way to heaven? He wants to stop us from living for God. He wants us to disobey God. And this morning, we're going to look at how Satan tried to get Jesus to sin. Hebrews 4.15 uh, reminds us that Jesus was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Jesus was tempted to sin in some of the same ways we are tempted. And so we can learn that the way Satan tempted Jesus is the way that he will also tempt us. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning, is what we can learn from the temptation, Satan's temptation of Christ in uh, Matthew chapter 4. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that you love us, mm -hmm. and that's why you gave us your word, so that we can know the truth about sin, about Satan, about the deception of Satan, about his goals, and Lord, you want us to not only know, but you want us to uh, avoid those and to be aware of them so that we can avoid the, the temptations of, of Satan. And uh, Lord, we, we just thank you that he is not all-knowing, but you are. Uh, he is not all-powerful, but you are. Uh, he is not in control. You are. Amen. And yet he's deceptive. And he has people believing that everyone gets to heaven. And he has people believing that uh, God sends no one to hell. And he has people believing all kinds of strange things that are contrary to what your word says. And so, Lord, I pray that our desire would be to listen to what you say and to take to heart what you say, and to not just hear what you say, but to obey it. And uh, thank you again for your love. Thank you for what Jesus did for us. And we pray it in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 4, if you're using a pew Bible, uh, I would imagine that if any, any series on the devices of Satan is going to, the, the schemes, the plan, the plots of Satan is going to, have Genesis chapter 3, which we looked at last week, and Matthew chapter 4 in it. Luke 4 is similar, but we're going to look at Matthew again. A pew Bible, it's page 704. 
Uh, please follow along. I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. Uh, Matthew 4, verse, starting with verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter, of course, is the devil, came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he, Jesus, answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus saith unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. <clears throat> again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Uh, my guess is that most of you have are, are familiar with this account in the Bible. I think even children have heard about the temptation uh, of Jesus. And so you've maybe heard a sermon on it, maybe several. Uh, you at least know of it. And structure-wise, uh, pretty straightforward. There's an introduction, verses 1 and 2. There's three temptations that Satan gives in Jesus' response. And then in verse 11, at the end, Satan leaves from him. And Luke, we're told that he left for a season. Doesn't say that here. Um, here's a few things you may not know. John, the book of John, does not talk about this at all. Doesn't give this account at all. Mark, two verses, and leaves out a lot. But Matthew and Luke have extended. Uh, Matthew has 11 verses on it. I think Luke has uh, 13. Uh, something that you may not know, uh, again, is that the order of the temptations in Luke is different than the order is here. Uh, the second temptation here is Jesus takes him to the top of the temple, jump off, cast yourself down. In Luke chapter 4, that is the third one. Uh, so does that mean that there is a contradiction? Different order? No. Uh, neither one says, here is the order that it happened. They, gave, they wrote what God wanted them to write, and a lot of times uh, God, used, God always used the personality of the writer, and there was always the audience in mind. So for whatever reason, God wanted the order to be different in Matthew than Luke. And so it, it best fits the needs of the audience. So that's, that's enough on kind of the intro uh, and the background. So what I want us to do is consider these three temptations and how they apply to us. Number one, Jesus, of course, was unique. Okay? Not number one, but something to think about before we get into him. Uh, Jesus was unique. Jesus was God in human form. So the temptations that Jesus had were different to a certain degree that, you know, none of us are going to be tempted by Satan to turn stones into bread. Why? Because we can't do it. It is impossible for us to do it. It was possible for Jesus, and so that's why that, that temptation came. So it's like, okay, God has it in the Bible. There has to be something underneath that temptation then that applies to us. And so that's why we're going we're gonna to dig into these. We're going to look at them. And I'm giving you three, as, as we, we're going to do three temptations, all three of them. And then each one, I'm going to give you these three points, uh, sub-points. Uh, the, the temptation as in an appearance on the surface, what it looks like on the surface. Uh, secondly, the underlying principle, because that's where it gets to where we are. Okay, we can't turn stones into bread, but what was Satan trying to do? That we will find out. And then uh, number three, lessons for us. So number one, temptation number one, 
uh, found in verses 2 through 4, change stones into bread. Change stones into bread. And here's the appearance on the surface. Jesus was hungry. He had not eaten for 40 days. Jesus had a literal physical body that was just like ours. He got tired. He ate. He drank. He needed to fell asleep in a boat on a stormy sea. He, had, he got tired. And so he was hungry. And Satan came. And what we sometimes can miss in the English that I like to bring out uh, from the original language is that uh, Satan does not come in an accusatory way. He actually comes in a caring way. He's not, if thou art the Son of God, then do this. It's not that kind of a conditional statement. It's a, you are. Since you are the Son of God, since you are, why are you hungry? Why don't you just turn these stones into bread? So he comes caring and almost flattering and not questioning him, not attacking him, appealing to him. Hey, you can do it. Just do it. You're hungry. What's the big deal? That's the temptation on the surface. Letter B, the underlying principle. And here's the underlying principle. Here's, here's how it pertains to us, and not because we can't turn stones uh, into bread. Underlying principle is temptation. The temptation was to choose the physical over the spiritual. Choose the physical over the spiritual. How do we know that? Because of Jesus' response. Jesus' response in verse 4, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It's, it's almost as if Satan, or if Jesus is saying to Satan, you want me to focus on what comes into my mouth instead of me focusing on what comes out of God's mouth, God's words. It's almost like that's what Jesus is saying to Satan. Man shall not live by bread alone. And I think we see this, this temptation to choose the physical over the spiritual. We see that when we think more and we look more at the context. Uh, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8, chapter 3. We're not going to turn there, but I have on your outline, I've, I've actually given you the couple of verses before that, so we want have the whole context. And uh, It's a little long, but follow along. Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 3. Moses, right kids? The book of Moses. All right. Moses wrote Deuteronomy and Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Uh, Deuteronomy 8 says, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he, God, humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know, and here's the, the quote, that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And so in that, I, I have emboldened for you to help you see it better, but in that passage of Deuteronomy, there is an emphasis of obedience. There is an emphasis on obedience. Uh, all the commandments which I commanded you, observe to do. Don't just be hearers, be doers. I led you through the wilderness and there were trials and difficulties and the trials and difficulties were to determine, are you going to follow me or not? Are you going to only obey me when things are good? Or are you going to obey me all the time? And then I want you to know that life, and that's how it ends Deuteronomy 8.3, and that's why Jesus quoted, I want you to know that life isn't just about your belly. It's not just about the physical. It is not just about the here and now. It is about the spiritual. It is about hearing and doing what God says. God's people 
in the wilderness were hungry at times. Jesus was hungry at times. God fed them manna, and Satan is like, hey, just make yourself some. God was concerned about the physical needs of the people, and he met those needs, but God wants us to know, and we need to know and understand and believe that God is way more concerned about our spiritual state than he is about our physical state. And some of us can attest to that. We have health issues. And uh, I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings, but they're going to get worse before they get better, right? I mean, that's the reality of getting old and living in a sin-cursed world. God is more concerned about your holiness than he is about your happiness. You know, if we chose the way to be happy, we would be 30 years old, physically fit, and strong as a horse, and, you know, do work all day long and not be phased, and, you know, that's, that's the state we would pick. But that's not how God works. But God wants us to know it's not just about your body. And so the lessons for us, let us see, how does this apply? A couple things. Uh, Sub-point number one there, Satan tempts us when we are needy and according to that need. Well, duh, you know, Satan did not come to Jesus when he was full and said, hey, turn these stones and why? You know, Satan comes to us when we are weak in the areas of our weakness. We can see that here. Uh, Satan tempts us to look, uh, sub-point number two, Satan tempts us to look to ourselves instead of God to get us out of the difficulty. Satan didn't tell Jesus to ask God for help. Satan told Jesus to fix the problem himself. He had the ability, and, and that's our tendency, is to fix things ourselves instead of looking to God for the help. God wants us to be dependent on him. And so Satan wants us to do the same. He wants us to trust ourselves. And then uh, some point number three there, and, and we know this to be true, true, a preoccupation with physical needs can cause us to neglect spiritual needs. Preoccupation with physical needs can cause us to neglect spiritual needs. How many of God's people say they don't have time to read God's word because they're too, or go to church because they're too busy trying to make ends meet? How many people try to pursue the world gain the world, and end up losing their soul? How many people go to great lengths to protect themselves from a virus and not think at all about the fact that, you know what, it doesn't matter if the virus gets me or a car gets me or a heart attack gets me, I'm going to die. And there is an eternal part of me that lives forever. And people so focused on protecting their bodies, but don't give a moment's notice, not a moment's thought about their soul, the eternal part of them that lives forever. Let, uh, Luke 12, I have there in your outline, Luke 12, 4 and 5, uh, Jesus speaking, I say unto you, my friends, a little bit different than COVID, but uh, people uh, that are against you, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed have power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Fear God who has control over both your body and your soul. Not Don't fear just a virus that all it can do is kill you. It has no impact on where your soul spends eternity. Temptation number two. Temptation number two is cast yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. Cast yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. We see that in verse 5. The devil taketh him up into the holy city, set up upon the pinnacle of the temple, saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Satan, again, wasn't if you are the Son of God. It's kind of interesting. He changed up the tactic. Instead of you, as God's Son, helping yourself out, 
Show people your trust for God. Show, don't, don't, don't bail yourself out. Show people your trust and your faith in God's word. And Satan even quotes God's word. Trust what God says. He would be demonstrating his trust in God. In essence, he's saying, you're his son. Angels are going to catch you. They're not going to let you land on the ground and kill yourself. Show everybody down below that's going in and out of the temple that you are God's and God's, God protects you and God honors your word. That's the appearance on the surface. Uh, the underlying principle, though, I think, is this, letter B, the temptation to choose the supernatural over the normal. The temptation to choose the supernatural over the normal. Here's what I mean by this. Does God want us to have faith? Yes. Yes, he wants us to have faith. We saw that a couple weeks ago, right? Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. God wants us to have faith. Are we supposed to hide our faith or show our faith? We're supposed to show our faith. How do we show our faith? We show our faith by works, by what we do. And so Satan is kind of trying to appeal to that. Uh, we show our faith by our works. James 2, 18. I love this verse. Yeah, yay. A man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. And then he says, you show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. You show me without, but I'm going to show you with. You know anything about Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, it is not what they believed in their head, is so-and-so believed God and went and did this, and went and did this, and went and did this. Their faith was in action. And so God wants us to show our faith. Jesus was often asked to do a sign to show who he was. But we need to understand that God wants our faith to be steady and consistent in everyday life. Uh, lessons for us, let her see. Uh, we need to know the Word of God and use it properly. We need to use the Word of, know the Word of God and use it properly. Satan used the Word of God. Satan quoted Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is a psalm of trust. And so he used an appropriate psalm for the occasion, so to speak. Now, if you really study it, he left out certain words. And, of course, the psalm was writ not written to do extravagant, crazy things to prove God. Uh, Satan used the word of God wrongly. Rest assured that Satan still uses people to teach the Word of God wrongly. He still does. That, that's that's a, a tactic that he used on Jesus, and he still uses it now. There are false prophets. There are people that preach the Word. And I use quotes because they use the Bible incorrectly. Cults start because people take verses out of context. And we are warned over and over again in the Word of God about false prophets who teach damnable heresies. That's God's Word, not mine. Damnable heresies. They are heresies that send people to hell. Satan masquerades. People, people are Satan's workers when they preach the Word in a way that is false. And to suggest that people go to heaven because they were baptized as a baby, or they go to heaven because they belong to such and such a church, is false doctrine that Satan loves and that God can't stand. Satan, we, we need to know the Word of God and we need to use it rightly. We need to use it properly. Secondly, some point number there, people that are weak in faith often seek an extravagant sign. People that are weak in faith often seek an extravagant sign. Uh, remember Gideon? God appeared to Gideon, and times were hard. It, it was a time of, of uh, where Israel was struggling. They were captive to uh, 
Ammonites, I think, but God appeared to Gideon in, in Judges 6. You don't need to turn there, but he said, I am with you, mighty man of valor. And Gideon's response was, show me a sign. Show me a sign that you talk with me. And Gideon didn't just say that once. Three times he asked God for a sign. Not because he was strong in faith. It was because he was weak in faith. He was timid in faith. He needed assurance that God would do what he said he would do. He was weak in faith. And then uh, number three there, God, I mentioned this earlier, God desires a life of steady, stubborn faith. You know, it's good to be stubborn in th some things. To have a stubborn faith in God is a good thing. That's a good thing. God wants us to have a steady, stubborn faith. He wants us to believe that he is there and that he cares and that he is working and that he has everything under control even when it doesn't seem like your life is turned upside down. And faith is what gets you through. You want to be rescued, but faith is what gets you through that. You keep on... It doesn't feel like God loves me right now. <laughs> Circumstances don't seem like God loves me right now. But I am going to have a stubborn faith that hangs on to this book and God's word and says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And so that's what I'm going to, that's what I'm going to hang on to. I, I struggle a little bit in this. And, and here's what I mean. Do I want to see God do great works in our church and in this Eden? Yes, I do. Would I love to see us at some point say, all right, pastor, we got one or two church, one or two choices. Make the church bigger or have two morning services and half the people come at one time and half, man, I'm good with that. I'd love that. That'd be awesome. Okay, but, and then I start thinking, then, then as I was praying yesterday, I'm like, wow, are you looking for extravagant signs? Is God working in hearts? That's God's work too, isn't it? Is God working in hearts? Is God, pe is God changing people's lives? Are people having more and more of having a desire to grow in holiness and obedience for God? That's God working too. And so as much as I want to see God do certain things, I also need to make sure I'm not falling into, I just want extravagant signs or I don't believe you're working, God. I need to have faith that God's word is not returning void. And then... So point number four there, don't make foolish decisions to tempt God, then expect him to deliver you from the fallout. You like fallout, right? Um, don't make foolish decisions to tempt God and then expect him to deliver you. Jesus says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Don't buy a car, don't buy a house, don't buy toys that you can't afford and say, well, sorry, God, I did it. Now bail me out of this mess. Okay, that's, that's tempting God. That is being foolish. All right, we need to be good stewards of what God has given us and we, and we need to depend on his leading and guidance and those kind of things. Number three, temptation number three, fall down and worship me. We see that in verses eight through 10. The appearance on the surface, look at verse 8, again, the devil taketh him up unto an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. This was probably a, a vision of some kind, okay? There's no mountain to really get high enough to see the whole world at one time, so we, you know, it's, it's probably a vision of, in order to see all the kingdoms of the world. And so he, he wanted him to think on that, or maybe it was just envision that, uh, in the glory of them, verse 9, and he saith unto him, Satan says unto Jesus, all these things, these kingdoms, will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Of all the temptations, this one seems the boldest and the most absurd. Satan really asking Jesus to bow down and worship him. How crazy! Some commentators suggest that Satan tried to smooth attack the first couple times and now he's taken off the mask and he's just being bold and going right for the, the throat, so to speak. Uh, 
It seems bold. It seems dumb. But underneath, there is a principle. The underlying principle there is that there was Satan was tempting Jesus to choose compromise over contentedness with God's timing. To choose compromise over contentedness with God's timing. Here's what I mean. Jesus was promised a kingdom. Jesus is going to inherit a kingdom. Daniel chapter 7 for the Wednesday night group. Four times in G Daniel chapter 7, we see that God has a coming kingdom that will last forever. Uh, some verses, I just gave you the references there uh, on your outline, ran out of space, but Isaiah 9, some of us are familiar with these uh, kind of used at Christmas time, Christmas verse, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Talking about Jesus. The government shall be upon his shoulder, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And then it says this, verse 7, of the increase and of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with, judge, with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. Jesus is going to sit on the throne of David forever at some point. That is a promise of God. Jesus is going to get a kingdom. Uh, the angel spoke to Mary. Again, I just gave you the references. Uh, Luke 1, 31 through 33, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. Here's this angel's message to Mary. Uh, you will bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great. He shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. So Jesus was getting a kingdom. Jesus is promised a kingdom. There are a number of other places, and, and that's enough for now. But the, the underlying tactic was this. Satan was promising Jesus a kingdom now. You can have it now. Don't worry about God's timing. You can have it now. You can have the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them now. There's, Luke talks about, it is in, Satan says, it is in my power to give them. There's a debate, okay, how do you believe a liar about that? But uh, the point is, he's saying, here's, here's the deal. Here's the bribe. It was just more than bowing down and getting the kingdoms ahead of time. It was at the expense of, of skipping the cross. Bow down now, get the kingdom, skip the cross. He'd get a crown. He would get a crown without the crucifixion. He would get glory without grief. He would get praise without the pain. And so that was the temptation, was, you know, think about it. He was going to get this anyway, and... Just skip all that stuff. Praise the Lord. Jesus saw right through that and said, no, uh, shortcuts aren't allowed. I'm going to do what I have been called to do. A body thou hast given me, and that body was to suffer on the cross for us. Letter uh, C. Satan tax, tactics haven't changed. Satan still, some point one, state, Satan still wants people to bow down and worship him. Satan still, now, does Satan come to you and say, are there people that outwardly, openly serve Satan? You know, in the military, the military has religions, okay? Wiccan is a recognized religion for the military. You can claim on your paperwork, I am a witch, okay? Uh, there are people that openly, but Satan doesn't do that to us. Uh, Satan is more subtle than this. How does he tempt us to bow down and worship him? The same way he tempted Jesus. Think first about you and your kingdom. Serve yourself. If you serve yourself, you are not serving God. And if you are not serving God, you are serving indirectly 
directly, however you want to look at it, Satan. So serve yourself. Look out for yourself. Live for yourself is what Satan wants us to do. That is the same result as bowing down and worshiping him because when, it caught, when we serve us, we disobey God. Can't have two masters, right? If we serve us who have a sinful heart, we will not be serving God. So point number two. Satan is oftentimes behind quick fixes. Satan is oftentimes behind quick fixes. I'm not sure about you. This is more of a maybe an observation or an opinion that I have. But I've observed throughout the years that a lot of times Satan is on, Satan is the one that's behind, hurry up and do this or else. Satan, that's what he wanted Jesus to do. Don't wait for God to tell you when to eat. Change these stones into bread right now. Don't wait for God's timing for the kingdom. Take it now. Skip all this other stuff. Hurry up. Fix it now. Temptation comes to us in a little bit different form, but it's still, I think Satan a lot of times is behind quick fixes. You got to say yes to this deal or this decision or young ladies to this guy. Or to this opportunity now. Or you will never have it again. Satan is a lot of times behind that. I, now, don't misunderstand me. If God wants you to do something and he has made it plain that you need to do it, you shouldn't drag your feet. But if you're not sure about what to do and there's a, there's a tug of war going on and it's like, man, this, 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 and you're praying for wisdom... Uh, God, I believe, is okay with you making sure you're doing what God wants you to do. God will not, if, if you are unsure and you want to know God's will, God will guide you. God will guide you. But sometimes we want to fix things too quick and we don't wait for God's guidance. It is okay to drag our feet a little bit as long as we want to do what God wants and we're searching God's will and we're searching our own heart. And then number three, some point number three there, be content with God's timing. Be content with God's timing. The kingdoms are going to come to Jesus someday. He was content and is content. He's still waiting. Think about that. He's been waiting 2,000 years for his kingdom. He's still waiting. We need to have that same contentment. We need to be willing to wait for God's timing and not bring about things in our own timing. Jesus suffered. We will suffer too. When the suffering comes, and here's what we tend to do. When suffering comes, our prayer is, God, get me out of this as soon as you can. Yesterday was too late. It needs to be two days ago. You know, whatever. We, that's what we think about. Instead of, God, what are you trying to teach me through this trial, through this trouble? I have last verse there, 1 Peter 5, 10. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect or complete, establish, strengthen, settle you. We need to be content with God's timing when he brings things into our life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your word. Uh, Lord, a lot here, a lot to uh, consider, and yet uh, we would be naive and foolish to think that Satan would tempt only Jesus and not tempt us. We know he is a uh, he is our adversary. We know as a roaring lion, he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We know that uh, as your children, Satan does not want us to obey you. Satan wants us to sin. And so we need to recognize when he tempts us. And we need to use the word of God to fight him off the way that uh, Jesus did. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would work in our hearts now. I pray that we would respond the way that you want us to. Uh, again, if there's any here that do not know Christ, uh, that they are deceived. Uh, they're thinking what they do will get them to heaven. 
uh, they're under the, the spell, the lie of Satan, and I pray that uh, their my, eyes might be open to realize that Jesus is the only way for them to be forgiven. And again, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your warnings. Uh, thank you for escape that uh, you give us. There's no temptation taken us uh, that you enable us a way to escape. And we thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 A lot to think about. You know, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, you know, you can go online and read sermons on the temptation of Jesus and find different points and sub points and all those kind of things. And I'm, I'm certainly not going to repeat. I gave you... Ten lessons for us. I gave you ten different truths. I'm not really going to repeat all those, but I want to end with how I started. Satan has two goals. One, if you're lost, he wants to keep you lost. Two, if you're saved, he wants you to keep. He wants to stop you from obeying God. He wants you to sin and disobey God. And of course, the answer to both is the Word of God. So, first and foremost, are you saved? Do you believe what God says, that you are a sinner, that we will be held accountable for our sins, that we that sin keeps us out of heaven, that we cannot get rid of our own sin, but God has provided a way for us to be forgiven, and that's through Christ. We need to have Jesus, not just know about him. I've said this many times. Don't pat yourself on the back because you believe in God. Satan believes in God. Satan fought Jesus. Satan believes in God. We need to have Jesus, not just know about him. For those of us that are saved, are you trying to please God? Do you want to be not just a hearer, but a doer? That's what God wants us to do. Not just hear what God says. We need to obey what God says. And we certainly need to recognize that Satan is after us, wants us to disobey, and we need God's word to help us fight him off, resist the devil, uh, James 4 says, and he will flee from us. Stand if you can, 440. Mark and Don are going to come. 440, Jesus calls us. 440.